In this week's episode, we had Brian Koppelman, an incredible writer, screenwriter, creative force of nature in the industry. Michael, you've been following him for a long time. Yeah, he wrote Rounders. Uh, he co-wrote Rounders with his partner. That's that Matt Damon, um, Ed Norton movie mm-hmm. about poker, which sort of became super culturally relevant, even mm-hmm. if it wasn't such a hood at first. Mm-hmm. Um, he wrote Ocean's 13 with his partner. He created, co-created Billions with his partner and, and all the Billion spinoffs that are about to come. And mm-hmm. he's had this podcast that has just been a, a real influence on me. Mm-hmm. I'm talking to creative people, like giving people a language to talk about it with. Right. Um, he has just like this incredible access, like in, an incredible amount of respect around yeah. the industry. Um, he's like a mentor to a lot of people. So um, it was very, very cool to to talk to him and sort of hear. I'm used to hearing his voice mm-hmm. on a podcast, but not... Followed by my voice and your right. voice. It was very surreal. Cool. In this episode, we discussed creativity. We discussed the process. Discussed the idea of following your dream and pursuing it in a real concrete way. Mm. We hope you enjoy the conversation with Brian Koppelman on Buckle Up. We are honored today with a very, very special guest. Thank you so much for being on the show for our 60th episode, Brian Koppelman. My pleasure, man. Mm. Really happy to be here with you guys. Thank you. Thank so, you. So, yeah, you guys connected over social media mm-hmm. initially, and then you were kind enough to invite us in to do an episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Ami really makes me laugh. I think he's <laughs> an incredible uh, sense of humor and really love uh, your ability to capture the essence of people when you, you know, you're not just doing their voices, but it really feels like you're, I can see it the way that suddenly you're thinking like they are. And it's what I do when I write, you know, right. and, and so I, I, I relate to it and understand it. It's great. Yeah, you know, what happens internally, people ask, like, how do, how does it form? And it's kind of like a light switch, but what I've examined what goes on, and it's almost like you're looking at a mirror, but instead of seeing yourself, you see that person, and then, you know, if it's Jordan Peterson, it's just, mm. Okay, so, like, before you even say the first word, yeah, a lot awesome. of an impression is that subtle mannerism thing, and human beings are so adept to that, those subtleties, so. That's yeah, even of, just the, 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 the rhythm with which they speak, right? Right. The, the kind of words that mm-hmm. they use and the way that they pause. Um, There's and sort of what they're after, too. Like, mm-hmm. their arguments, the, mm-hmm. their style of uh, argument. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, you, really, you really do the thing. Uh, Everyone thing. has a melody to the way they speak and their own kind of inflection and stuff. So tapping into that. But then even the visual component, too, is All right, fun, uh, to, is do, fun to crack. Do Schneerson, quick. <laughs> do Schneerson. Schneerson. The Rebbe. The Rebbe. <laughs> 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 I believe you. I, it wasn't a word of Yiddish, but my parents are fluent, so I, <laughs> I get awesome. what I can. I can I can do impersonations of languages, yeah. but not actual languages. So do, when your, I actually, do your grandfather quickly. Very good. My, you know, Michael, do the podcast to talk like this day. And there was always <laughs> words in between the words that were in English. That had, you had no idea what they were. <laughs> Holocaust. Or my, and I would just nod through and catch what I could along the way. So it'd be like, Zaidi, would be like, what are you talking about there? What about the TV there? And you're turning on the TV and watch the shows, the shows, the shows. The shows. <laughs> what year was he born? Oh, I wish I knew the exact year, but yeah, all my grandparents on both, on both sides, Holocaust survivors, one side Poland and the in other In the side. camps? In, yeah, he went through none of the big names, but he went through- <laughs> None of the big names. <laughs> you know, there's always Holocaust street cred. That's amazing. He didn't out. play Caesar's Palace. Almost, it was really, he was in Reno. He did the indie he was clubs. He in Tahoe and, but it was still <laughs> oh, my, And someone's nice like, room. oh, we had Auschwitz and Birkenau, you got nothing, you know. But he, yeah, he had a, both sides' families were just like white. It down, really has know. an incredible- survivors and their kids and their grandkids. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, to me, any lesson you can learn from them, it's so valuable to have been around, but also the scars and the way that those get passed on and the worldview, uh, which can go a number of different ways. I, I, Paul uh, Heyman on my podcast last week, was just a brilliant Mm -hmm. dude, I think. And, um, you know, his whole life is informed by by that, by yeah. his parents. His parents are Holocaust survivors. And mm-hmm. It's amazing watching, you know, the way his mother basically told him, I don't know if you heard the podcast, but mm-hmm. his, his mother uh, essentially said to him, you're not allowed to die because uh, you have to have kids and they have to be ready to pass on the message. Yeah. And that was like his whole childhood yeah. was like, you have to be exceptional and you have to put yourself in a position to pass on the Yeah. Message. Whenever I see a minivan double parked in Williamsburg, 
Just go like, that's the Holocaust. <laughs> that's the Holocaust. Forgive exactly. it. Let it go. That's yeah. hilarious. And they definitely had the mentality of like, my parents were pretty hands off growing up. And I think it's because they like used all their resources to raise their parents. So by the time we came around, it was like, we did it. You're here. Do your thing, you know, oh, and I yes. noticed that because I'm a little more I'm, my hands on with my kids. But like as and my my parents didn't have grandparents, there was like no model for them. So it's just an interesting thing to see as they age, like, you know, when you see them as people and not just as parents. Yeah, for sure. And, like, what that must have been like and kind of appreciating that because it was just a given in my house. Like, oh, this is what everybody went through. We didn't like talk about it overtly in depth, like what they went through. But we, we kind of knew that that was just when you're a kid. Reality is reality. Like there's no. You know, you don't yeah, of things, course, you, you know. don't have the ability to understand what other people's experiences are, right. especially if you're raised in a closed knit community mm -hmm. where people share all the same values. And they didn't talk about it. You know, they don't. They, you don't talk about your things. My grandparents they kept things oh, quiet really? and stuff like that. It wasn't until he was older that we were we were older and we could sort of sit it's, with them. And it's fascinating what you say about um, when you start to see your parents as as people, not yeah. just your parents. Because yeah. I'm on the other side of that because my kids are 27 and 23. So, uh -huh. you know, and it's different because I've been, I guess, because of what I do and wh where I am and that I talk into microphones a lot mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, they probably already had some um, sense of it, but it is now that mm -hmm. for sure that that's how they they, they know my me sort of as I really am, my wife too. Uh -huh. Yeah, It's a weird thing. Not merely as a, as a parent. You, know? you have them young also, right? Yeah. yeah. Too, we yeah. started kind of, I mean, for our era, young. Right. Um, I mean, actually probably not by terms of like orthodox people who I start to have kids sooner. Yeah, yeah first, like so similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. mid twenties. Yeah. And that's interesting because we, uh, we talk a lot also about like being in the, uh, you know, in terms of it being in creative endeavors, there's a lot of people doing it, but the ones that fall into a category of doing it whilst having a family that they're raising at home and little kids at home is a, like that, that category gets smaller and smaller. For me, it was like, because we had our first child, mm -hmm. that's what pushed me into wanting to really do this, mm -hmm. to become a filmmaker, to become mm -hmm. a storyteller. Because I was a blocked writer, I think, and unable to do this work. And was gonna just kind of drift, you know. I had a good career, like I had a career that was functioning. Mm -hmm. But when Sam was born, very shortly thereafter, I, I had this realization that if I let myself be a blocked writer, uh, I wouldn't, um, like, if if the creative impulse died, like any other death, it would become toxic, and that toxicity would ooze onto my family. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be um, an involved, engaged dad and husband, and I wanted to tell my kids that they could live their dreams and I wasn't living mine. And so for me, it had the effact, it was really catalytic. It, mm -hmm. It's what Lit the fire. pushed me. My, Amy was always telling me, mm -hmm. you know, do these things and super supportive, but it wasn't until our first kid was born that it was like, oh, this has to happen or it's never gonna happen. Right. I was so scared, what if I can't support them? What, but then I realized, yeah, you gotta solve all that. But what you have to do is find a way to feel like you're living you're from the place that's most alive in you, that you're building a career from the place that's most alive in, in you. And I think that's directly because I wanted to be the kind of dad who wouldn't come home mm -hmm. miserable and bitter all the time from working in a job that he hated. That's probably the best thing you could do as a parent is be the best version of yourself. Because when I, th I thought about this recently where it's like, I'm going away this week traveling and I have to leave the kids so I'm not gonna be physically present. But them watching me do what I love to do and pursue it is, that's what they're gonna take away when they remember, you know, what they, how they were parented. It's, it's inspiring not, for sure. Yeah, to yeah. see that, you I know, think so. the hard work. And I remember my dad doing all those things too. And like what they see vicariously, what they see going around them is parenting, whether you think you're consciously doing yeah. it or not, you know? Um, yeah, so you've said, I mean, so kind of piggybacking on that, you know, the reason you sort of accepted your calling was you saw, you know, because your, your son was motivating you or you, you know, you wanted to be the kind of dad that you wanted to be. Um, you've said before that the fuel that gets you to one point in your career doesn't burn as clean as it, as, as it once did. And, so, and it, it, it could like become rotten and like you have to find a new source of fuel at a certain point. So that, so that's sort of what got you into it. So I've always been curious, like now that, you know, you, you're co-creator of Billions, you have, you know, I think the three spinoffs were just announced, you have Super Pumped. Um, what's the fuel that you're using now at this point in your career? Well, I would say the thing I was talking about there was when you're fueled by anger. When mm -hmm. I said that that doesn't burn <laughs> clean anymore, it's the, it's the, the, the fuel that I think many creative people use it at some point and and it's um 
this idea that you're going to prove the doubters wrong, mm -hmm. that, look, all of us want to be seen for mm -hmm. who we are and the best of ourselves. And, you know, you have some idea. If, if you want to become an artist in your life, if you want to become an artist, um, you seem delusional right up until mm -hmm. the moment that you're successful, right? There's a very fine <laughs> line between being delusional and actually being someone who can do the work. Uh, and you don't know. You think that that's the case. And, like, yeah, you may have a supportive family who tells mm -hmm. you that that's the case. But there's also, it's very easy to recognize who the doubters are and to give the doubters power over you. And then in order to kind of take that power back, you can decide, and I think many of us do, well, I'm going to show them and I'm going to prove them wrong and I'm going to go do this. And you remember all the slights. You remember the way school wasn't easy or which teachers didn't believe in you. And that stuff, I think, helps to uh, give you this kind of like the initial fuel that helps you take off. Be, uh, but I do think that after a while, um, if you're still trying to prove something long after it's been proven or long after you realize that uh, they weren't even thinking about you, uh, it, it's not, they, you know, none of that matters. Yeah, yeah. You have to find or uh, um, the, an, a, a, a better reason, um, um, or for, for me anyway, a reason that, um, and, and what that reason b became was uh, the family, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how I felt. Like creating, getting lost in this work, that feeling of being hyper-present but also barely tethered to the earth that we get when we're engaged in a creative pursuit, mm -hmm. um, that's like really addictive. And um, it makes me feel like I have purpose. And, um, and so those things. And then also I've always, my whole life, followed my curiosity and obsession. And so... If, if I remain open and I remain curious and I um, allow myself to follow those things, then I'm working from like what I, you know, call like the most alive part of myself, mm. from the part of myself that's still got a childlike wonder or mm. that has this kind of like curious, relentless pursuit of a story, an idea, a way people talk. You know, I love language. That's, I think, why it started with me as a writer. I, I love vernacular. I love understanding people's specific idiolect, mm -hmm. you know, the words that they use. I've always loved that. I've mm -hmm. always loved watching movies over and over <laughs> and memorizing the dialogue and memorizing the pattern of the dialogue, the rhythm of the dialogue. And so that stuff's just like, I'm into it. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I write songs. Like, I'm a, that's my biggest hobby probably. A, 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 you know, and it's a semi-professional thing. Like, I write songs in a very like um con i concentrate a lot on mm -hmm. it and i um but for me that's like oh i i found myself drawn to that and so i just follow that kind of thing and right. and um i just note how i feel when i'm doing it and how i feel afterwards and how i feel if i don't do it for a bunch of days mm -hmm. and you know you get yeah. drawn back to it and yeah. so that's i mean that's how i i look at all this stuff um and i really try to divorce it from there's good pain and there's uh, bad pain, you know. Yeah. The pain of not doing it is worse than the pain of doing 100%. it. The pain in both scenarios, but you need one is one is the well, writing's hard and yeah. and you fail all the time right. and songwriting's super hard, you fail mm -hmm. all the time. Sure. Um but it's uh the rewards are so great because uh those moments when suddenly it's coming through you somehow are just incredible highs. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting about sort of your story and the order of it is usually I think for a lot of people, that self-judgment of I can't do these creative pursuits happens now that you have the kid and you have the family. All right, I've tried this thing, but now I got the family. I got the thing. It's time to, yes. you know, you know, revert back to all the people, the things people were suggesting to do in terms of stability and get to the safe stuff. And your story seems like it was the opposite, where you were on the industry side of things and said to yourself, you know, this calling is still like, you know. I have to do this. Like the, the kid was having a child was the yeah, springboard totally. into that, which is an interesting order. So I guess I'm curious, like what initially made you choose the industry side of things and then to go into the creative pursuits after that, once you had started, were starting the family. Cause you had models in your life, right? You were surrounded by artists growing up and you had some, but I was my, my, you know, my dad was in the business, but he was a businessman. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I think looked at the artists more like, uh, he had a huge, uh, he revered many of them, but I think also thought they were outsiders in a way. Mm -hmm. They were flakier mm -hmm. in a way. They weren't really grown-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, 
my father would always say to me too on the path to this, like, okay, but listen, you're going to go to musical, take some business classes, right. keep your eye on the ball, which is a big ball of stable cash. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know? Yeah. And it was it's, always like, it's a diamond, like, uh, and it's a, and to it's him a diamond that, with very few blemishes in it. Right. To, I mean, yeah, you know, and to him, that was just them. as good. Like, yeah, sure. Make the music, but music business, like something that was palatable that he could sort of understand. Right. So I was always kind of pushing myself into the parts of the industry that seemed like I could like sell it at a meal right. at a table with family. Me, say, oh, okay. That feels like not just an artist. You know? Or like yes. for me, it was marketing. I was like, oh, you're good at writing? You should do copywriting. Yeah. Like, yeah, or, yeah, well, sure. It like makes that. sense. Yeah, do yeah. the most creative business that, that thing you can That totally do. makes sense, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that completely makes sense. That still falls within your limited... But, uh, but uh, well, I think... Um, so why did you initially start on that side? And well, I never shift? thought I could do it. You mm -hmm. know, um, I had really bad ADHD. Um, before it was something that was just diagnosed like that, mm -hmm. right? They would just say a kid was hyperactive or something. Uh, no one, you know, one kid was on Ritalin in my school, but it just wasn't something that was offered to you. Mm -hmm. Therapy wasn't offered to right. you. There they took all those there kids and they put them in a different room. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of, yeah, there wasn't a lot of You're scaffolding. You're going upstairs. Who's going to groups upstairs? <laughs> yeah. Just rally them up. <laughs> and so there was always this disconnect between my sort of, capacity in a certain way and then mm -hmm. my ability to produce certain kinds of work. Mm -hmm. So I would, I struggled a lot in, in school and, um, I would always pull something off that would enable me to progress. I got to go to a good college because I'd like produced records when I, I did a bunch of shit and I mm -hmm. figured out how to like talk to the person who was the admissions person back then the world was different. You know, you mm -hmm. can take initiative in certain ways that I think it's harder probably to get past cer certain things. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was, I would always pursue these things I was into. I and mean, that's one of the things about ADHD. Like one of the gifts of it is the ability to hyper-focus. Mm -hmm. And so when I was really into something, the whole world would disappear except that thing. And um, where that's really a problem is, you know, I could, I was a huge reader of anything I was interested in, but the books mm -hmm. that I wasn't interested in, when you have real ADHD, the, it feels, um, ra the, it feels radioactive, like it's pushing you away. And mm -hmm. it, it was really a, a struggle. So to be a writer, I would, my senior year of college, I had seven incompletes my, that I had to finish at the end, at the last like month um, of, of college, because I would write, I could write three paragraphs that it was very clear I had talent as a writer, but I couldn't write any more than that. I was mm -hmm. just completely I was thwarted. I was blocked. I didn't know why I couldn't, couldn't find finish things. Ability. Yeah. I couldn't finish Lost. anything. I yeah. couldn't finish anything. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, until I absolutely was up against the kind of deadline that was so crazy. But, you know, while at college, I remember saying to the woman who interviewed me and I'm, I know her name, but I'm not going to say her name. Mm -hmm. Um, she was awesome. But, uh, I remember saying to her, like, I know that my transcript looks weird because I have these A's in English classes because I was into that and I have like D's and, uh, or C's and classes that I wasn't interested, mm. but you got to believe me, those teachers were super boring, <laughs> but I was like, but I'll do something that will like bring credit to this place. And, you know, it, during college, I started working with Tracy Chapman and made her first album. And mm -hmm. that was through the college, college experience. And that ended up, so I spent all this time focused on that. And that's what got me on, onto the, um, the business side of the music business, but you know, up doing artist and repertoire, which is what I did, A&R, yeah. you're really close to the artist. You're the closest thing to work to the artist. Um, you're the lia liaison and, and you're helping them make the records. Mm -hmm. But um, it was unsatisfying in the end. Uh, I, the part I liked the best was working on the songs with them. Yeah. Helping them with their lyrics. Not Tracy. She didn't need any help in mm -hmm. any way, shape or form. Um, so I produced her demos, but mm -hmm. you know, in the studio, it was just the two of us and an engineer and the, to do her demos, but she didn't need any help at all with the mm. songs. They were perfect. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but I, the part I liked best was that part and the rest of it I hated. Mm -hmm. uh, and my whole life I was in plays or directed plays or I, I always, I was always engaged in that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was always a, a huge reader and I would wake up in the middle of the night and write stuff, but um, I couldn't finish things. Uh, and then it got too painful. Like you were talking about, Ami, it, it mm. got so painful to not do it right. that it flipped. And a couple of things, I read Tony Robbins book, Awaken the Giant Within, and that book helped to point me to sort of do um, a kind of inventory and figure out what I needed to do, what I wanted to do. Um, and then 
David Levine, my lifelong best friend and creative partner, gave me Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way. And I read that book and mm -hmm. did those exercises. And then that got rid of me being blocked. Right. And uh, then I was able to start doing work. And, you know, I was playing a lot of poker. And <laughs> it just all sort of, you know, I didn't quit my job. I didn't say like, well, fuck this. I'm, I'm going to, you know, give the finger to stability. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be in a situation where um, I was going to make my kids and my wife and uh, struggle or that mm -hmm. we were going to, but I just cleared the time and mm -hmm. I got up earlier and um, just wrote, my best friend and I got in a room and just wrote this script. So it was like, let's just finish this script. Let's figure out everything we need to know to write this movie. Mm -hmm. And then that. And you were able to sort of using these techniques like, after reading this book, take that all that creative chaos and channel it into a discipline where you yeah. could just were you not focused on results as much as just the process. As long as you were writing every day, that's I just a win. knew if I'd show up, like yeah. I just had to show up every day in the morning, and if I could show up. Also, I was a fanatic. The hyper focus paid off. Like I was a fanatic about poker, about the way people talked. Mm -hmm. I'd read fifty books. I had all these books with language right. in them of that time period, and I yeah. was just fully um, immersed in that world. And I think working as a team was yes. very helpful. I was going to ask you something that helps with ADHD. Yeah, um, because you can show up for the teammate. You can finish the work for the the for accountability the and the and the built-in audience that a, that yeah. a partner gives. Somehow, you. whatever that magic of that, and yeah. so that worked. Then later, now I I uh, I got to a place, but I wasn't treated with medicine then mm -hmm. um, for like a really long time. Right, uh, and just had to kind of figure out how to how to how to do this stuff. But then you know the, we. It turned out we weren't delusional and mm -hmm. we wrote something that was, you know, uh, had the effect of galvanizing a lot of people to want to make the movie. And mm -hmm. that, you know, you don't feel nuts anymore. That also is a kind of uh, a, a way that like the enthusiasm of that is a very adrenalized kind of moment mm -hmm. and it can push you forward also. And given that this became a success, the, was this like the first big at bat where you're putting all your time and energy into something? that's got to be an amazing feeling that it goes all the way. Do you feel like there's also a downside to not having, going through a stream of things that didn't work first or? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because I've seen I mean, it with was, people where they, 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 something, their first thing hits too early and it's like, for them, it's an amazing thing, but I, then how to I, replicate. I or, think a few things. If it would have yeah. happened in my early twenties, it would have been bad. Right. I was 30, 30 years old. Right. So I was ready. Yeah. Um, See, so yeah, I, I was, I was 30 when we started writing mm -hmm. it was uh it changed our lives we became professional screenwriters and filmmakers mm -hmm. but it was a commercial failure at first mm -hmm. now it's become a classic but mm -hmm. it wasn't and um i laugh and doyle brunson the most legendary poker player ever died um the other day I, we're talking about rounders I for the folks tremendous yeah. uh, amount of <laughs> yeah. respect for him yeah um, but like in his New York Times obit, it talked about rounders and mm -hmm. um, the sort of seismic influence rounders had in the mm -hmm. culture. But none of that wasn't like none of that happened in the first year and a half mm -hmm. that the movie came out. So I had the failure. I had right. the feeling of a movie coming out and right. bombing and being criticized and then having to pick ourselves up and get the next thing made. So right. it wasn't like easy street. It was like, okay, we're in it now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the big pressure then was like how to get I I had this really clear feeling of like. Right now, one movie is just like a dot, um, <laughs> but two on a graph create a line. <laughs> and that yeah. once we had a second one, now there was a line. Now a trajectory we were, were moving in, and we were, that was it. We're, we're on a path you of don't a know career. If it's this way or this so way. the second one, it was really crucial to get a second thing mm -hmm. made. And that, that was, was what I, and that, that, and once we had a second thing made, I, I felt like, okay, we maybe we can string this together yeah. and really do this. Well, the reason I ask about like the, the sort of dangers of, something succeeding on its first like attempt is, you know, a lot of artists, creatives, writers, they, they have trouble killing their babies. They, they stick to one thing. They get, they get invested in something and forget about the process of just, you have to keep doing this and keep doing this. And they, they, they dig their heels in on one project and that becomes the thing that they will not give up on or use as fuel for the next thing. And I don't know, I feel like sometimes it's, it, you have to like, there's something valuable in, just continuing to create and continuing to create and each thing builds on itself and, and learning from that. You sure. Know? Oh, I think each of these paths, ha, um, you, I think you can like take, 
direction from failure and from success. Mm -hmm. And it's figuring out what the right direction to take from those things sure. is, right? Mm -hmm. um, you learn very early on though that you have to kill your darlings. Mm -hmm. I have fewer kids than you guys, so I can't say kill your babies. Okay. We need to not kill the babies. You know, we have very few. <laughs> you, you guys, it's fine. You have We're so just many. Reproducing. Yeah, you have so many. It's totally different. Um, Atheists need a break even. You that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you it's a different two, whole situation. It's not totally different. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of different, but um, we have but we have more to spare. You know, it's like that's yeah, what we I'm have saying. backups. Saying, but, <laughs> but no, you early on. Any kind of writer realizes yeah. early on, um, you have to be willing. Look, it's really hard to know though, right? It's mm -hmm. really hard to know when you got to fight yeah. for that thing or when mm -hmm. you have to say, well, okay, I got to fight for the next thing. That's what I'm my talking lessons. about. Yeah. But man, I think that's like a case by case. I think that's just like a case by case thing. It's um, only up to you essentially. It's like when to let it go. Like it's- I've had too much, I've dealt with too much rejection mm -hmm. where um, the experts were wrong. Right. I don't. I think it's got to be like some kind of um, internal. I, I think that you have to build a, your own sort of prism through which you look at this stuff and and decide, find a way to get dispassionate, mm -hmm. get enough distance to be dispassionate and decide. Um, are the criticisms that are coming in, so they make you feel bad. They make everybody feel bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how long do, do I need to process before I don't feel bad anymore? Mm -hmm. All right, maybe that's a week. Okay, I've taken the week. I feel, okay, I can, I can stomach this now. Now let me look at those comments. Is there anything in these comments that can help me make this thing better? Mm -hmm. Is there anything in these comments that tells me that there's a fatal flaw in this that I wasn't aware of? Uh, if not, can I just look at this thing holistically now and say, it's worthwhile to continue or it's tainted for mm -hmm. um, a variety, one or another reason. But if I do that gut check, get past the anger or get past the sadness, and then look objectively at the piece of material, I think that Dave and I have learned to look at that piece of material and then make a judgment that we should continue mm -hmm. or that we should stop, but not based on the not based on the fact of the rejection, perhaps based on um, the uh, underlying content of a rejection, or though perhaps just saying the underlying content of that rejection um, misses what's essential about this. Um, it's, it's hewing to an, uh, an old idea about the business or it's hewing to what worked last year. Uh, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put that aside and I'm just gonna decide that, no, that this thing has worth because mm -hmm. Over and over, um, we have faced that kind of rejection and uh, found ways to turn around. And it started for me with Tracy mm -hmm. in college, where all these record companies rejected her and told me I was crazy. And um, it happened on Rounders and it happened on The Illusionist and even some on Billions. So like, I've found that the things that have had the biggest impact in my life have been things that many experts didn't believe in at first. Right. And so I don't put faith in in the, the fact of gatekeepers <laughs> closing the gate. Sure. But I never did though. You, you, have a, you have a good track record of your instincts always kind of panning out over people's feedback. But there are people who I've come across, it's like their instincts also need to be sharpened and worked for, even their personal judgment of their work, where- Of course. Like the advice of just keep doing it or like follow your dreams and doing that. Like I struggle with this idea because- some people take that advice to mean no matter what anybody says, I trust myself and I'm going to do it. And you're like, okay, well, songwriting, for example, in the world that I came from and before I started doing comedy, it's like, you know, I, I think this chorus you could cut in half or I think you cut the verse and I get to the chorus because you're losing me. Or yes. You're going to lose the listener. No, I'm going to do it this way or I'm going to try to do this well, metal. And you're that's like, the your emotional... production is, is raw, man. We got to mix this better. And they say, no, I'm following my dreams and doing it the way I well, want to do that's, it. But that's the initial... Look, to create a piece of work requires the, you to go into this um, place of um, freedom and trust, mm -hmm. right? So that you can, Springsteen says, grab something from the ether. Mm -hmm. And it's really delicate and fragile. And so at first, I think everybody 
everyone has a like a there's a time continuum mm -hmm. and everybody somewhere on that time continuum would react that way no this thing's fucking perfect <laughs> but so you got to train yourself to find out where that for you for me that might be 12 hours after i write a scene i don't want to hear from anybody mm -hmm. but 15 hours after writing a scene i can look at it objectively and i can go these four lines can come out let's change that yeah um because the the thing that i have learned so i'm a massive proponent of the idea of having a big dream and chasing it mm -hmm. but what i think is often left out and is you have to apply massive amounts of rigor to achieving that dream and rigor definitionally means having a critical eye toward mm -hmm. improvement. Mm -hmm. So yeah, follow your dream, but what, look, Tony Robbins talks about follow your dream, but look at what's not working and look at how you can course correct. Right. That's valuable. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like the first, when, when David and I were writing rounders, um, we had a different title. We had a different opening line. I, we didn't find the opening line, which is the thing that people talk about all the mm -hmm. time. Um, not the first voiceover, but, but, um, uh, when 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 Matt's character asks for the thirty thousand dollars in chips, he says, mm -hmm. three stacks of high society." For a long time, that line was different. It was just much more basic language. Mm -hmm. It was like, "Give me three big dimes," and that may sound like a small thing, but the whole tone of the movie um, survives based on that first thing he says to Teddy KGB: three stacks right. of high society." It tells you what you're in. It tells you you're in this weird world or whatever. It sparks and curiosity. And we couldn't find that. Mm -hmm. And like we had the script basically done, except that line was just like driving me fucking crazy. <laughs> and Dave too. Um, because you're constantly looking at the work and going like, how can it, I have this, Salinger writes about this great. Um, you know, I have a feeling that I'm trying to get out. It's not, it's not, and this happens in art all the time. You can't quite get that feeling out onto the page or into the song. So you keep chasing it mm -hmm. and you, but you have to apply rigor. Yeah. And so, yeah, of course, when you first write a song, <laughs> you're like, this melody can't be improved upon. Uh, this is the right tag. It's just born. It's a baby. Yeah, like because it it's a tag line. Right. <laughs> then as it grows. But, you know, <laughs> you put it away and you listen in four days and you go, oh, wow. I didn't realize I used the same word twice. in the. I used the word in the first verse and I used it. Well, right. well once you're fixing that, now mm. the whole thing's open. Yeah. Now it's like, oh, we need a pre-core. Actually, if I go to the minor, you know what? If I yeah. go to the six. That's what I want to hear. That that accentuates what I'm trying right. to say. If I just go to the six right before yeah. I go to the three, now the four, now it's totally different. Yes. Um, it sets it up. And in fact, you, you know what? I, the, someone can tell us, oh, I was right. The chorus is supposed to be just that progression. But yeah, dude, yeah. but you forgot. It was just flat because right. the whole thing was one, four, five. Right. And you didn't just go to the two or the six right. and then set up the chorus. Ah, the world. Then different. you got to de-Berkeleyize yourself. The people who get out of school showing off their education and their music, you're like, oh God, you don't need to do everything. You well, know? sometimes it's fine to just. But one four five works yeah. all the time. Don't break two it. one four five. There's works. a whole process it's, you go through when you're getting educated yeah. in creative education. That's, it's like you try to show that, off everything you know and then get out of it. One of the best things I did yes. was partner up with people who didn't have traditional. I mean, school. I love the national so system like, because it's so yeah, simple. To, exactly. Just to, you know the the way to. Uh, it's like you come full circle. At first, you're just playing with very basic, and it's like kind of corny. But then you go through super sophisticated, and then back again. And you find the hardest stuff to write is the simple stuff, okay. you know, back yeah, to Yeah, to make it. great melodies yeah. over just simple yeah. chords. Though it's, yeah. But Seinfeld uh, was on an episode of Tim Ferriss and he talked about this idea, like when he writes, when he's writing new bits, there's a, the first day he writes it, no criticisms, no nothing. Right. It just is what it is and no one's allowed to look at it. He doesn't ask anybody about it. That is, then he runs the experiment, maybe on stage. Then he comes back and then he's brutal. Right. Mm -hmm. Then he's mean <laughs> to himself. That's the editing room for yeah. me. When I'm in the yeah. editing room, I mean, whatever script I was sh writing and shooting, mm -hmm. in the editing room, I'm just going to completely reinvent it if I yeah, have to. Yeah, yeah. To make it work. Um, and the same thing with tightening scripts, but also the whole career path thing. Right. You 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 have to decide which ones you're gonna fight for, but and you have to take real rigor. Like mm -hmm. Dave and I didn't meet a couple days a week. We went every day. And mm -hmm. every day we worked as hard as we could, and we would write these pages, and then I'd read them over that night at home late after work and take notes and come back and like doesn't mean you're going to succeed. Like there's no mm. guarantee in the arts, you know, show business doesn't owe anybody a living. Mm -hmm. And so you got to figure out why you're doing it and you have to do it because it makes you feel alive. Mm -hmm. And if it does, 
then there's nothing anyone can say that's going to stop you from doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing contradictory about being open to all the things that will help improve upon your creative craft. Uh, that's the pitfall to just watch out for. You can keep yourself open as you're doing this. So you had a video on TikTok about not a revision. You're just making it better. Don't think you're watering things down. You're making it better. Yeah, you're just improving yeah, it. Right. Yeah, just right. you always have the opportunity to make something better. Right. I'm curious yeah. about you said art doesn't owe you a living. You seem... You seem genuinely interested in things that are both artistic achievements and commercial successes and interested in artists who can achieve both. Like, um, I think in your work, there's like, it has a certain bigness to it. Like cultural rele relevance seems really important to you and your work. Well, when that just happens, like, <laughs> I don't think that that's something that, I mean, when Dave and I were in their room writing a poker movie, I mean, that mm. was not... I, we just felt like we love this. And if we love it, other people are going to love it. Like mm -hmm. I was so into poker. I wanted to tell the world about what was so amazing about mm -hmm. people who tried to earn their living playing cards. And mm -hmm. um, so it's like a sense of discovery and curiosity. Mm -hmm. I don't think you ever can know that something's going to land in a, in a certain way necessarily. I think it just might end up landing in that way. You know, mm -hmm. like I never made superhero movies. I don't, I don't ever, I'm not interested in that really. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm interested in like the way people speak and the way they behave. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm interested the Coen brothers and Scorsese and um, uh, Quentin Tarantino and Soderbergh's movie. I mean, these are the things that mm -hmm. were exciting to Coen brothers. Yeah. more than like anybody else. And yeah. the Coen brothers were not making mass entertainment. They were making these small movies. They were just right. hilarious to my friends and me. Mm -hmm. right. And that was what kind of, those things all were inspired. Spike Lee, you know, mm -hmm. was making movies for uh, himself. And then they just happened to really resonate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it seems like you are drawn in, in ways to human superpowers, like characters that have a lot of 100%. social power, where there's this back and forth on a human level of like, you know, whether it's, whether it's poker or whether it's just in a room, like what drew you to those kinds of characters? Where did they come from? But people who I, I dominate think there's a, there's socially. A split. I think that there are some writers who really enjoy writing about people who are um, dumber than they are. Mm -hmm. Like writing about criminals who are <laughs> really yeah. like not that, I like writing about people smarter than me. Right. I like being around people who are smarter than me. Yeah. I like learning about worlds that are hard to think through. That It's all just about like that thing of, so like one of the things in The Artist's Way is to do morning pages every day, three mm -hmm. longhand pages, free writing. And um, that's how I figure out what I want, I'm interested in. And that's what I end up being after creatively as, a, mm -hmm. as an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that, you know, I as a I love um, I love a movie like The Right Stuff about these incredibly smart, fascinating people, you know, mm -hmm. um, or smart, fascinating people who make wrong choices, like mm -hmm. in Wall Street, right? right? Bad people who or people who've made decisions that are um, really not additive to society, but they have this incredible capacity to process and synthesize information and mm -hmm. talk in a really compelling way, and mm -hmm. and I mean that's from the beginning been something that's really um, uh, always appealed to to me you know mm. um bob dylan's my favorite musical <laughs> artist of all time he's the smartest to me mm. the smartest person ever picked up a guitar mm. i'm just drawn to that stuff right create that's just where i li live mm. Mm. yeah i wanted to ask also about um uh creative identity like the way you talked about in your early days uh you were producing music and then you shifted into these other creative ende uh, endeavors of, of writing. Um, and that, I feel like a lot of creative people struggle with this idea that the second you label yourself something, yes, you in, in a positive way channel your focus, but you also disqualify yourself from everything else. If this is a perfect, I think you should ask me this one as Jordan Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, ha, I don't really like the way the question is formulated, Brian. You know, it's like, you have to orient yourself towards something, you know? It's like, and if you lose that, man, I don't know if it's something, but it's certainly not nothing, you know? And yeah. you have a fine line between order and chaos. And clearly in your early 20s, there was a, 
man, there was a whole lot of chaos, you know? And That's awesome. I, I just really only, <laughs> I, knew that was gonna I only like him through your, okay. I only like him through well, your version of it. That's him. a great compliment. Well, you know? Uh, that's, yes. I, I, <laughs> well, you know, okay. That's so awesome. And what do you think about lobsters? Have you thought of making a movie about lobsters? <laughs> You know, I, I've considered the lobster. Everyone should the really anthropomorphic the lobster, lot. literature the is clear. Yeah, you know, they're just like human beings. They might be. I had claws when I was an adolescent. I had to <laughs> shed them and become a man. Um, Are you allowed to eat lobster with your steak? I, I, thought I just had to steak. ask a rabbi about that. I know. I thought just steak, <laughs> Mr. Peter. Right, Dr. Oh, Peterson. No. <laughs> just steak and olive oil, and that's that. <laughs> so that's what I would say. Um, no, so I would say that, <laughs> creative identity. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's scary to call yourself a writer or a painter mm -hmm. or a musician, right? Yeah. But as soon as you're doing the work on a regular basis, I think it's empowering to call yourself that. Mm -hmm. And um, and and for me, once I was going every day and doing it, I was happy to say I'm, I'm writing. I don't think mm -hmm. I said like I'm a writer probably until I sold something. But I was, but I do think if you're doing it, then mm -hmm. you're doing it. Right. Like you're... I, I think, you know, just putting on a beret and walking, it doesn't make you a painter. Right. You know, but a beret and an easel and some paints, mm -hmm. now we're getting somewhere. Yeah, but there's also this, like, when you're engaging with it and putting stuff out there until you're getting a reaction. I don't know, it's just for some reason, I, I, I struggled. It took a long time for me to say I'm a, I'm a comic because I'm like, I'm a musician. That's what I'm doing. Right. I'm a musician. This is what I know. This is what I come from. This is what I've been in, always gotten feedback for, uh, even though I got impressions. I mean, I, yeah, I don't really, I say like I write songs as my, as my biggest hobby mm. and I'm into it. I mean, I've gotten like, um, I've gotten a bunch of cuts mm. as a songwriter, but I don't really like label myself that mm -hmm. way. Right. Exactly. But I am. And like, mm -hmm. sometimes I do. Right. And I want to right. be more like more and more. Like, did you struggle with any sort of imposter syndrome kind of yeah, sense? Of yeah, when you got well, into the, in the writing at, at I a think when age. I was... I, um, out, of, out of music producing or whatever whatever you identified as your creative pursuit. Because in your case, there's a lot of different ones, you know? Some people knew that this is what I am and this is what I yeah, am. Yeah, I think everybody... I think if, you've, if you have any kind of learning difference or if you're neurodiverse in any mm -hmm. way, you're, the, the, the imposter syndrome thing is just riding along with you. Yes, yes. Not... I mean, I don't feel that way anymore mm -hmm. in this thing that I... Do right. because that's just too many years of sure doing it and when you when you're lucky enough that there's an audience for you you know dave it's not our audience isn't always a huge audience but dave and i have an audience mm -hmm. of people who for whatever reason they're on our frequency like mm -hmm. I, I, it doesn't make what we do good or not good it just means there's a group of people who are interested in the thing that we want to do mm -hmm. um they're on our wavelengths in some way we're out there we are going and finding something that they're going to be interested in because they're like us in mm -hmm. some way, right? Um, but I think when you are neurodiverse, when you have something like a learning difference like I did, mm -hmm. uh, because what happens is from a young age, you have people telling you you're very smart and then you have other people going, why are you failing? Mm -hmm. And that dichotomy is really difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and it leads to that kind of like uh, questioning but then I was able to mostly, at a certain point, I was able to accept, well, I write every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I produce some kind of work and uh, it's got a voice and a tone. And so I, this is what I do and who, mm -hmm. I, who I am. You have to stop caring about other people's opinions. I mean, that's, it's, and it's worth, it's worth kind of disambiguating that because mm -hmm. it's not that you just say fuck off to other people's opinions. You have to get to the place where you just take the, it's the opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the opinions have value, you take what's nurture, what you take the, the nutritive part of it, right? But you leave the person out, like mm -hmm. the judgment, the negative stuff. You're just interested in, can this help the work in some way? Um, and then, then that's empowering instead of disempowering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think it takes a while. Like uh, right when you start, you just want to be doing it. It takes a while to want to be good at it. So for that to be the, the motivating factor. That's like, a big I want distinction. This to be really good. But like yeah. he said about Seinfeld, like, yeah, the first time you write something, entertain yourself, make it fun and exciting and interesting to you. And like, you get that feeling. 
but then yeah, really quickly you become super rigorous about making it good. Right. Mm -hmm. The best you can right. at where you are at that moment, your own yeah. ability at that moment. Um, I'm my daughter's a stand up. She's hilarious mm -hmm. and she's doing 15, 16 sets a week. Out. Yeah. And you know, and she's natural. She, she's one of those people where every night someone comes up to her and goes, how have you only been doing this? Five? You seem like you've been doing it for eight years. She's very good at it. Mm -hmm. But I've watched her even realize like, just even if a tape gets laughs, I've seen her, you know, just rigorously like rewriting the jokes mm -hmm. and finding it again and working on before. And it's like, you have to just keep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, putting in the reps, it's creative fitness. You have to show up and put in the reps. And then rewrite, like listen yeah. to the tapes. Back. Like, yeah. you know, that's what I've been doing. There's a, everyone tapes themselves doing comedy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't go back and listen and then <laughs> fix it. Yeah. The other part of that is go the next day <laughs> right. and really listen. Was that my friend laughing? <laughs> Did the room laugh? Yeah. Why didn't that land? Right. Is there a better way to say that punchline? Sure. How can I tighten it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, especially when if you do well in a night, mm -hmm. go listen to where you didn't do, like, yeah, it went well. What did you get away with? How, yes. <laughs> How can you now paddle to the metal and make it better? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I, um, I, I've been doing it too, putting in the reps of like the stand-up circuit and uh, yeah, watching the clips back and stuff. And you get a sense, I mean, you get a weird subjective experience being on stage and thinking what worked and what didn't. And Sometimes the tape like reinforces that, but sometimes it doesn't. You're like, wait a minute. Oh my yes. God, I am just muddling through this. Especially if you're working out new stuff. Like Because yeah, premises. you can feel like, oh, I use seven sentences when there should be two. Exactly. And you trim the fat and that's that's part of the process too. But one thing that you touched upon is like, uh, it's all about just doing it and then you can identify with that craft. But it's what I think is pretty destructive for a lot of creatives is this idea of trying to project what category you fall into on the success versus like the ones who make it, the ones who don't make it. Like, am, am I on the path like, I think Bill Burr was talked to said on his podcast. He was sitting there like mid thirties at a club. He's like, man, am I just a guy who's not going to make it? Like sitting there with this sense of this trajectory that you don't know about is gnawing at you. Which category am I in? Am I the guy who's like, you're, cause well, you're, you're, it, you're, you're this, you're this other self avatar that's judging you as a person. It's like, really useful to. That's a hard person to be. Set up the terms of success for yourself. Mm -hmm. Like, um. Wondering if you've made it is a disaster, I right. think, because that can shift. Mm -hmm. Like I've decided a long time ago, it, it's a good day for me if I've meditated, done morning pages, done some kind of exercise, spent time with my family, mm -hmm. done some work. That's it. If I did those things, if I did those things, that's a good day. Right. Right. Um, and by the same token, like you could drive yourself crazy wondering... If you've, you have to go back to like, what did I want? What would have been the dream? I, I used to ask people this all the time on the podcast. Like, what would your ambition have been like right out of college? Mm -hmm. What's success? Like as a comedian, if you pass the seller, you've made it as a comedian. Mm -hmm. Now, because yeah. only two people become, you know, what, every year, what, 10 people get a special mm -hmm. out of 20,000 comedians? Yeah. You know, if you pass it like the seller and maybe one other place, well, that's it. You've, mm -hmm. You're you're a comedian. Right. You've done the work as a comedian. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yes, you could say to yourself, well, okay, I want financial success that's beyond, I think they're still probably paying the rates they paid Paul Provenza and John Stewart in 87. Mm -hmm. Like they're probably still paying 60 bucks mm -hmm. uh, a set. So you can't get rich. You know, you can't maybe feed your family at the, doing two sets a week at the cellar. But I would still say, I remember when Dan Soder called me, he was, he was uh, maybe had gotten a gig like he quit his waitering job to go do a gig for a beer company or mm -hmm. something where he was like doing that. But then he called me and he goes, um, I'm getting up tonight. Esty's going to watch me. And he called me the next day and he's like, I passed. Mm. And that was, I remember feeling like, okay, Dan's on the other side. Uh -huh. Like there's the side of you before you've passed the seller. And then when you're on the other side of that and you can sit at that table, you're a comedian. Mm -hmm. Nobody can ever right to the take, bottom of the pool. Right, <laughs> but no one can take Love that me. away from you. I've seen him murdering. I saw him in L.A. like a year Dan? ago. Yeah, just, the hardest just, working person in the world. When we were both doing open mics together, yeah, he was the hardest working person I ever saw. I mean, mm -hmm. all he would just do every check set in the city. Like, uh -huh. oh, if you put me on a check set, I'll do it. If you give a thing, I'll go to in the morning. I'll do it. Like, he just wanted to get good. Yeah, and was willing to rip up his act to get uh -huh. good. You know, all he cared about was becoming great right the best that 
that yeah. he could. And when he got past the cellar, it's like, no one can take that away from him. Right. You're a comedian now. Yeah. Maybe now some people might define it before that. Maybe that's too, maybe that's too rarefied a thing to give Noam and Esty that mm. sort of, but to me, that's if someone asked me, I would, if my daughter asked me, like I would say, you know, you can get up on that stage. Right. Like you've been past there. That, But yeah. And did you find that your attitude toward, did you have a certain like attitude toward success, which was more binary until you're on the other side of it. And then you realize, oh, this is really just about the process of doing it. Doing it is the success, which is a mindset that you hear people talk about who've, who've had successes and then people perceive it as, all right, man, you're there. And you're like, I'm at the top of the, you think I'm at the top of the mountain, I'm at the foot of the hill, bottom of the mountain. I, I would say thing. I didn't spend a lot of time on that. I, I spent a lot of time on, uh, I wanted to get one movie. I, <laughs> I felt like one movie made originally, that yeah. was it, right? And right. then it was like, okay, I have to get two movies made. Mm -hmm. And then I don't, I never calculated the career stuff exactly. Like I didn't think in those terms because the battle for me was to do the work because mm -hmm. of ADHD, mm -hmm. because I could never do work and I was always judged a failure and not living up to my potential. Mm -hmm. It For me, it was always, can I produce work every day? If I can do some work, that's enough. Mm -hmm. Then professionally, it was like, can I just get this, if I could get a movie made? And I would do anything to get the movie made and I worked my ass off to get the movie made. And to even though I wasn't a producer, Dave and I acted like producers and put the movie together. And I, of course, I'll do anything I can to make the thing mm -hmm. happen. But most of the time, it just starts from a spark of like a feeling, a curiosity, you know, reading Neil Berger's script for his first movie, who Neil wrote and directed The Illusionist and mm -hmm. The Billions Pile Limitless. But his first script, Dave and I produced it. We'd never produced anything that wasn't ours. And when it was, we were in the editing room at Knocker and Guys and I read the script because he was, his wife was a friend of my wife and we'd met. And I was like, well, we got to help this guy make the movie because it's fucking great. Mm -hmm. And we just like figured that out, but, but not because I, we had a plan, like let's become producers. Right. If you'd asked me five minutes before that, I would not have said I wanted to be a producer. But I read his script and, and I was like, oh, I, I can produce this because I there's not room to write this or direct it. He's going to do that. It's great. I can help. I guess, Dave, we should produce this. And Dave read it and was like, I agree. So it's organic, right. that part of the process. And um, and yeah, I never, I would say once we had a movie made or a second movie made, I didn't waste a lot of time. I wasted a lot of time hoping I could keep a roof over the head, but I didn't waste a lot of time wondering about whether we'd like made it in show business or what right. but you seem to have an easy we time kind on. of assuming certain roles that were that were required for us to get something done like all right i'll, I'll produce it because if they feel that that's the path to get this made i'll do that yes you know and that's been a, a, a gift uh, yeah because i don't i think because i don't spend a lot of time worrying about um somebody conferring that upon me mm -hmm. Or the industry can giving you permission on me, right. or giving me permission. It's like, why? Who? <laughs> why would that be the case? It's like, well, let's figure this out. Was there a lot of social pressure during those years? Like, I guess after your second movie, maybe like between that and Ocean's Thirteen, like you're like fairly young, successful guy hanging out with other young, successful people. Like, did you feel a certain pressure where you? Well, I look in New York. I mean, in New York, the pressure of like <laughs> everyone else having a lot more money than you do, yeah. and even if you're doing things that have like profile right. in a way. Also, Knock Around Guys was not a success. I mean, you know, again, now to whatever people think of the Vin Diesel speech, but at the time, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, it wasn't like some bi big success. So no, it was, yeah, uh, you wonder, you certainly walk around and wonder about keeping it going or mm -hmm. about like, but I think one of the great things as a practice was just, we just showed up every day and started writing the next thing. Yeah, That's the real, yeah. look, I'll go to real extremes. Like, it's not that it's easy to take those roles on. Yeah. Like, I've told this on my podcast, but I haven't told it many times. Um, uh, when, when we wanted to get Solitary Man made, and that was, I wrote that movie myself and Dave and I ended up directing it. Uh, but I wrote the script and, so, uh, and I knew that the script was good enough to get, like it was the best I could do. Um, and I knew it could attract an actor. And we, Steven Soderbergh read the script and gave it, loved it and gave it to Michael Douglas. And, and, and then even at the beginning when it was like us and, and Michael and, 
it, it, it was really hard to get the money for that movie raised. Um, and it, I felt really defeated early on. And then I remembered something that I'd read in uh, at, uh, Awaken the Giant Within about like taking some step every single day. It doesn't have to be a big step, some, doing something. I was like, all right, how am I gonna remember to do something every day to try to get this movie made that the business is telling me is impossible? Hard to get this money raised mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Like if I if I would have changed the ending, I could have gotten the money, but I didn't wouldn't change mm -hmm. the ending. Um, and I at the time, Nike had these uh, this thing where you could um, design your own Nikes. Mm -hmm. And I went online and I they had this one where you could have a word that repeated on the shoe if you wanted. And so I wrote the word solitary man, the words solitary man in this thing. And I got these pink sneakers that um, were like covered in the, I just had the word solitary man written um, on the toe a bunch of times. And I wore the shoes every single day for a year until we got the movie made so that I would look <laughs> down and I would see it said solitary man. And I would be like, I have to make a phone call or send <laughs> an email or do something to try to get the movie made. And it was like every day yeah. it's like, Oh fuck, I'm wearing these fucking sneakers again. Uh, but I'll tell brain you hacking, brain hacking. I will tell you the <laughs> day that I walked onto the set wearing those shoes with the holes in the soles of them, because I'd worn those shoes every fucking day for like 18 months to then walk on set wearing those shoes and and there's Michael Douglas and we're filming it. Yeah. Like that is kind of like nuts to do in a way, <laughs> but I was just like, well, I am not gonna be able to live with myself if I don't find a way I've written this story. And it wasn't because I wanna call myself writer because it was because I had um, a need to tell this story in this way I'd written this script. Uh, my partner was ready to direct it with me. I, Michael Douglas was a dream of my life to work with. And it was like, I can't allow this not to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't matter who tells me no. Uh, and you see, so you, you, you get in this mindset because it's not a casual thing like, hey, I'll produce. It's like, okay, what's this require? I guess this requires me fulfilling that function and then understanding what that means like, okay, it's not going to be easy. I'm not going to be flipping about it. That's why I said at the beginning, have crazy dreams, but then the rigor work with it, know that it's going to cost you a lot. Mm -hmm. It's going to require a tremendous amount of rigor, of, of work, of rejection, of barreling through of pain. Mm -hmm. And then just trust yourself that it's going to be worth it on the other side. And these techniques of sort of treating your brain like this hackable software, if I could create an environment that will that will sort of trick me into staying yeah. on course. Like ever since I started writing down stuff in front of me, I'm like, okay, I can leave a whiteboard right there. I put the things It works. Because the brain creatively can be so chaotic that things just pop up. Oh, I should do that. I should do that. I should go here. This is all exciting. But then channeling it into a disciplinary, you know, regimen is, well, is what yeah, makes and the it, difference. Look, it, and it all sounds also almost too good to be true because when you tell it in reverse, mm -hmm. when, you, when you tell it in reverse, it sounds like, well, of course, or it sounds easy um, mm -hmm. because we've already done it. But what you need to know if you're listening to this is like, it sucks. <laughs> and it's every, your failure is most of the time what's happening. Like right. most of the time in a creative pursuit, you're not doing it as well as you want to. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be as good as David Mamet or mm -hmm. the Coen brothers. It, you're going to come up against the limits of your talent, ability, brain, energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to wonder, as I did, if it's going to, but if you can do it, mm -hmm. it's really hard. I mean, look, not hard like you're, Holocaust surviving grandparents. That's the other thing, right? Mm -hmm. Only hard in the context of once you lay a dream out for yourself, you feel like a failure if you don't achieve it. <laughs> um, like you're letting yourself down. But so I didn't just take the script. Well, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hear that's hard. But <laughs> yes. I mean, say, you know, it's yes. So you I'm but also relative, having an awareness all, yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. One grateful. of the gifts of living in New York City yeah. is if you have eyes, you walk around New York City, you're just aware yeah. in every moment of what real fucking Champagne problems versus you sadness know. and failure <laughs> looks yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. But then within the context of wanting to be an artist, mm -hmm. the taking steps is the only thing. So the businesses, all the businesses of the arts, 
strip you of your agency all the time. You mm -hmm. feel powerless, mm -hmm. right? So taking some action r allows you to grab some of that agency back, some of your own power back and, and remind yourself how much is in your, yes, a lot of stuff's not in your influence, but it allows you to remind yourself how much is in your influence. Bert Kreischer on your episode was talking about creating his own destiny. This is what I have to do. He's gone through the middlemen, the gatekeepers, being strung along in these different scenarios. And it's like, I have to take I mean, the reins of my own destiny. At this. You know, w amazing. Yeah. Was any of your content creation part of that? Like, I'm gonna have at least one thing I can control, a podcast, an Instagram account, a TikTok. Mm. I can broadcast in the way I want to. No Not matter. consciously. Like, yeah. no, the podcast came out of wanting to have these conversations. Like, mm -hmm. again, curio I, curiosity. Like, I just find, my whole life, I realized if I just follow my own little path of curiosity, it's mm -hmm. gonna lead me to a good place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just like wanted to have those conversations. And I felt like I could, it was one of those things like, I, you know what happened? I thought maybe I could do it listening to Elvis Mitchell and Marin in the beginning and Bill. And then I went on Bill's podcast and did this really long podcast. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, I was like, oh, I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I talked to him about it and he agreed. And so then it was like, all right, well, let's, let's try this. The vines were definitely me speaking to myself, right? Mm -hmm. The vines were me at a low ebb career wise, reminding myself of why I did it. Mm -hmm. I, I okay. didn't realize that then I thought mm -hmm. I was, but it was like a way to reaffirm these core yeah. principles. Right. Right. And that led it. So it was like the vines and the pod started all at the same. It was all the same thing, really, mm -hmm. like being interested in talking about this stuff cool. and meeting people who inspire me um, and who can, you know, when I, you know, I, I can talk to Adam Duritz and ask him how he wrote around here. And like, why, why wouldn't I want to do that? I, I do want to do that, mm -hmm. you know, get yeah. to talk to Paul Heyman for two hours. Mm -hmm. as like a mind boggling to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, I think you did a I think there was a lot of value I definitely gained from the conversation in terms of squaring the the rigor from the dream, these two ideas and unpacking what the rigor is and that that's such a part of it and then maybe people give up on the dream because the rigor is something that they're not anticipating or realizing you can't just is float. Yeah. yeah, you can't just float. Yeah. Um well, thank you both. And thank you for uh, your this time. was really fun to have this conversation. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, a big fan, so okay, thank uh, you. thanks Us for doing too. this. Thank, Thank you, Brian you. Goppelman. Uh, that is Buckle Up, episode 60. Great talking to you, Brian. We really appreciate it. Awesome. All right, we Thanks. do a little thing with fingers in. <laughs> we do. Thing we do. Right. Boom, buckle up. Michael was like, are we going to do this? Yeah, sure. <laughs>